Okay, so basically we are going to talk about partnerships and we're going to um, go through a bunch of problems just like we have done in class. So as we start, we're going to talk about specifically what are partnerships and what are the benefits of partnerships, how we record the initial capital that partners put into the business, and then we're going to look at how we record the income or the loss for each partner, and then if an, a partner gets admitted or withdraws during the period, we're going to look at how we're going to handle um, those that aspect of accounting for a partner, and then ultimately liquidation. So um, we're not going to really spend much time on learning Objective 6. We're going to cover a lot um, in this chapter, and we're really covering a lot more than you'd ever need for just a Principles 2 class, but you're going to finish with a really good understanding of partnerships. So we know all these business entities are separate entities, and we talked about that um, in, I believe, Chapter 1, that businesses the the transactions are recorded separate from the owners or from the creditors or customers now generally a partnership is a, an association or a joining of two or more people to carry on as co-owners of a business and of course this business must be for profit because we know if it's not for profit then either it's a hobby or it may be a nonprofit um, type of entity where people are um, are having some type of um, organization to benefit the public as a whole. They are separate entities and as a result they have their own separate set of books and with um, partnerships a partnership is a voluntary association of individuals. Partners are legally responsible for his or her partner's actions regarding actions of the business. Not every partnership has what's called a partnership agreement, but it's really a smart idea for partnerships to have a written agreement understanding what the name of the business is, what the purpose is, the partners and their shares and duties, how much each partner's invested, and how they are going to determine the income and the losses that flow through the business, how those are going to flow back to the partners. Now, the reason partnerships have limited lives is because um, when a partner gets admitted or a partner withdraws, goes bankrupt, isn't capable of performing the services, or dies, the partnership as it was is no longer. And so partnerships change as a result of the partners within the partnership having um, changes within their personal life. So the purpose of having that agreement really helps spell out what happens in the event of um, partners being um, admitted or um, leaving the company. The bummer with a partnership is that they have unlimited liability for all the debts of the partnership. If the assets of the business aren't enough to pay the debts of the business, creditors can seek payment from the personal assets of each partner. This is a real concern. That's why limited liability companies have become such a forefront in when there are two or more um, individuals wanting to associate in a business because of this unlimited liability um, aspect. So the main thing that um, let's talk about before we get on the accounting, the benefits and the disadvantages of partnerships. They're real easy to form real easy to change them and real easy to end them. It's better than a sole proprietor in that one person has only so much capital and knowledge, two people have double the capital and double the knowledge. The partnership um, tax implications flow back 
to the individual partners at their tax rates, there are no corporate income taxes for a partnership. And of course, partners do have a lot of flexibility. They're running their own ship and they don't have the legal structure of um, corporations. So it, it truly is uh, much more flexible than we're when we're dealing with a corporation. The disadvantages, because the life of the partnership is limited, that can be a negative for the continuity of a business. And the other big negative is no matter who the partners are in a business, you really need to know those partners because one individual can bind a, the entire partnership to a contract. So um, you are ultimately liable for any debts one of the partners um, gets you in as a result of the business. This unlimited personal liability is a huge negative. When a, with a sole proprietorship, you have unlimited liability for those actions you make. But with a partnership, you have unlimited liability for the actions the partners make, any of the partners make. Um, of course, a corporation, you have a lot of people coming together to raise capital. With a partnership, it's better than a sole proprietor because you have several people that can come together and raise capital. So what let's do now is talk about the accounting for getting a partnership investment going and then recording those income and losses. Accounting for partnership is similar to accounting for a sole proprietorship, except we call it something different. We call it partner's equity, and then there's more than one partner, and so we have to divide the income and losses between those various partners. So as you see here, you can see that um, in a sole proprietorship, when um, Mr. Largo invests into the sole proprietor, we're going to debit cash, would credit the capital. And then when money is taken out, we would debit withdrawals, credit his cash. In a partnership, we've just got more than one person here. So we will credit our capital and we will debit our withdrawals from those similar types of transactions. And so as you see here, um, in the partner's equity section of the balance sheet, the balance of each partner's capital count gets listed separately. So we have the partner's equity and we have each partner listed separate for a total of the various partner's ec uh, capital accounts. So each partner is going to come into the partnership bringing in cash or assets um, according to how the partnership agreement was spelled out. If a individual brings in assets, those assets need to be recorded at the fair market value of the date they were transferred into the partnership. And so um, in that respect, their capital into the partnership will be the fair market value of those assets. The assets invested by a partner are debited to the proper account, and then that amount that um, the fair market value is is going to get credited to the partner's capital account. So, for example, if an individual brings in um, um, equipment that's valued at 50000 then the debit would be a debit to equipment, the credit would be a credit to that partner's capital account that brought in that asset. Let's look at an example here. According to their partnership agreement, MIND will invest. So Melissa's telling me she um, can't hear a thing. Um, Melissa, it might be that you um, don't have your... Um, speaker on. What I've done is I went ahead and called into the meeting. If you look up here and you look at audio, um, you can 
um, I called into the meeting, you may call into the meeting. I am recording this so you will be able to listen to it later. Okay, so Mind will invest $28,000 in cash and $37,000 worth of furniture and displays. And Padilla will invest $40,000 in cash and $30,000 worth of equipment. Related to the equipment is a note payable for $10,000, which the partnership assumes. So we've got two different partners, Mind and Padilla. And so what we're going to do is show how we're going to report the accounting for the cash and the equipment and um, assets coming in and the capital account. So as you see here, we're going to show for the first partner cash of 28,000, furniture and displays of 37,000, and then the capital account for Lori Mind of 65,000. That was her initial investment into the partnership. Likewise, we're going to do the same with the other partner. Show the cash of 40, the equipment at the fair market value of 30. We also need to show the note payable that is coming in based on that equipment of 10,000. And then the difference, Rose Padilla Capital, will be a $60,000 capital balance. Please understand that it Rose doesn't have 70,000 here because she's bringing a note in against the equipment and so she has 60,000 in capital against her um, account. So Lori has 65 and Rose has 60. The values assigned to the assets would be included in the partnership agreement. These values can differ from those carried on the partner's personal books. So example, um, the equipment Rose contributed had a value of only 22000 on her books, but again, she gets to increase it at the fair market value um, as of the date she's bringing it into the business. So on June 1st, Daisy and Malcolm form a partnership to operate a fitness center. Daisy contributes cash of 24000 and Malcolm contributes exercise equipment that costs 20 but it's valued at 16. So in this case, we're going to take the fair market value of the equipment that's brought in. Our debit to cash for 24, our debit to exercise equipment of 16, and then we'll um, credit each respective capital account to show their contribution initially to the partnership. Now, when a partnership creates income, or unfortunately if they have losses, we have to go and offset that to each partner's capital account. If the partnership agreement says everything is split 50-50, then that's how we will do it. If the partnership agreement has, generally they will spell out exactly how we distribute the income and the losses. If it's not spelled out, we do it equally. Income in a partnership has three components. We're going to call it return to the partners for use of capital, compensation for services that the partners have performed, and then there might be other income that we may have to allocate between the two. So distributing income and losses basically starts with their ratio that they've agreed upon in the partnership agreement. If each partner is making an equal contribution to the firm, each can assume the same share of income and losses. Now, remember, though, just because they contributed an equal contribution doesn't necessarily mean their, um, an equal contribution does not necessarily mean an equal capital investment. One partner may be devoting more time where another partner might have more capital they put into the business. So. Um, it, their reasons for how they are investing into the business may be different. If partners contribute unequally to the firm, unequally, unequal stated ratios can also be appropriate. The most important piece here is that the partners spell out in their agreement how the 
um, get the income and losses are going to be um, divided. So as you see here, Mind and Padilla have a net income last year of 140000 The stated ratio is 60% for Mind and 40% for Padilla. So the way we compute each partner's share of income, if they made 140000 then Mind gets 60% of the income. Padilla will get 40% of the income. So as you can see here, we allocate mind share at 140,000 at 60%. Padilla is 140,000 at 40%. I think someone has their um, their speaker on. You might want to mute it so that way we don't all hear it. Um, the way you can do that, if there's an audio or mute me, that's what you're going to want to do is up here mute me so we can't hear it. So basically what we'll do in this journal entry to allocate that income is we will show the income summary as a debit and we'll credit um, based on that specific allocation, Lori Mine Capital Credit for 84,000 and Rose Padilla capital of 56,000 distributing the income to those partners accounts. Now we can it, um, allocate the income or losses according to the capital balances. So we'd use a ratio based on the partner's capital balances at the beginning or the year or we can um, average it over the year. So if we do it that way, what we'll do is at the start of the year, on July 1st, Lori Mines' capital balance showed 65000 and Padilla showed 60000 In this example, these balances total to be 125000 So what we can do is allocate the um, income or the losses based on their capital balances. Hey guys, I don't know um, whose um, system is on. Kanika, I think you're in here twice. You can see you're in here over here. Okay. So you and so what I'll do, I'm going to be recording all this. So just so you know, if you're having a hard time, but Kanika, with this one, what you can do is you can just, you see up here where it says mute me, you can click mute me so I can't hear you. But you can still hear. Okay. So basically, as you see right here, we're allocating their um, gains or their income and losses based on their capital accounts. So um, Lori would have um, 52 percent of the income and Rose would have 48 percent. Know that these ratios must equal 100 percent in the end. The income each partner is going to receive is going to be their total income based on the ratio. So 52 percent for Lori, Rose is going to be at 48 percent here. We also can do it based on average capital balances. So what we can do is we start the beginning capital balance by the number of months that balance remained unchanged. And then from there, as the balance um, increases or decreases, allocate it kind of like on a weighted average. So what the way in which we would do that is we would show when the balance increases or decreases and adjust it accordingly. So as you can see here, um, they started at Lori 65,000 and Padilla 60,000 and then um, Lori withdrew 10,000 on January 1st which is going to change her capital account and Rose withdrew 10000 on November 1st and then went ahead and invested another 8000 on February 1st. So as a result of that, 
we're going to adjust their capital balances based on the money's flowing in and the money's flowing out. So you can see here from July through December, mine's balance stayed at 65000 So we'll show 65000 for six months, come up with a total there. Then we'll show it went from to 55000 because they he she took out 10000 It went 55000 for six months. We total this divided by 12 to come up with her average capital balance. We'll do the same with Padilla. She had four months at with a capital balance at 60000 Then she had three months with a capital balance of, of 50000 then she had five months with a capital balance of 58000 So again, we total it, divide it by 12, to come up with her capital balance of one six, excuse me, 56667 So if we do that, we'll find, come up with the ratio, 60000 divided by the 116667 to figure out the um, 51.4% is going to be mine's share of the income. Padilla's share is going to be 48.6% of the income or the losses. So we'll use those ratios to figure out how much gets allocated to each person. You can see there's all kinds of ways to allocate <coughs> the income and losses. Really important to spell that out in the partnership agreement. So then we've got other things, items that may come into play that get added to each individual's partner's capital account. Now, sometimes partnerships um, work individually and each may be given a salary or they may be given interest on their capital balances because of the amounts contributed to their capital balances. So salaries and interest don't get deducted as expenses before the partnership income is determined. That, those salaries or that interest gets allocated to each of the individual partners prior to distributing the rest of the income based on the ratios. So as you see here, um, to illustrate the allowance for partner's salaries, assume that Mind and Padilla agree to annual salaries of 8000 and 7000 so 8 to Mind, 7000 to Padilla, and to divide any remaining income equally among them. So what we'll do is we're starting with this 140000 of income. We will take off the top of that 8000 give it to Mind, Take 7,000, give it to Padilla. So now we have 125,000 of income left. Then if we're dividing it equally, then out of the 125, 50% or 62,500 is going to go to mine, and 62,500 will go to Padilla, which is then mine receives 70,500 of income. Padilla is going to get the 69500 in income. Now if we take it and add another piece to it, not only are we allocating salaries, but now each one receives 10% interest on their capital balances. So as you see here, we, um, we allocate the, um, let me see if I can mute somebody. Oh, let me see. I can't. Let me see. I, can someone see who um, has their system on? I'm trying to mute you guys so I can't hear you. Maybe that worked now. Um, okay. Sorry about that. Um, so basically what we're doing here is the we're allocating the salaries and after we allocate those we're down to 125 then we allocate 10 percent interest on their beginning balance 
So mine's beginning capital balance was 65,000. 10% interest means we're going to allocate 6,500 to mine. Padilla's capital balance was at 60,000. Allocate 10%, so they receive 6,000. The 65 and the 6, we're going to reduce this income by 12.5 which gives us a new balance of 112,500. And then the difference gets allocated at 50%, or each partner is going to get 56,250 each allocated to them. So we have then distributed the entire 140,000. Now you see the allocations are unique and separate based on the fact that mine salary was eight, Padelia's was seven, and then their share, their interest was allocated on their capital account. So there's a thousand different ways they can allocate this income. It really needs to be spelled out in the agreement. Um, so um, basically what I want to do is take some time and go through a problem so we can work through exactly what we've done right here. So now what I'm going to do is go to my screen and uh, find my book. And let's look at a problem here. Let's start with um, E3A. And in E3A, Hannah Hark and Jamie Rice are watch repairmen who want to form a partnership and open a jewelry store. An attorney prepares their partnership agreement, which indicates that assets invested in the partnership will be recorded at their fair market value and that liabilities will be assumed at book value. So we know the assets are going to be recorded at fair value, liabilities will be at book value. The assets contributed by each partner and the liabilities assumed by the partnership are followed. So you see with Hannah, she contributed 80,000 in cash. She contributes 104,000 of accounts receivable. 8,000 is going to go against the allowance. Supplies at 2000 equipment at 40 and she is contributing 64000 in liabilities. Jamie contributes cash of 60 accounts receivable of 40 allowance for uncollectibles of 6 supplies of 1000 equipment of 20 liabilities of 18. So it looks like they've each had their own business and they're basically joining ranks. So our job is to prepare the journal entries to record the original investments here for Hark and Rice. So let's look and see exactly how we're going to handle this. Um, if we go here, you'll see that um, what we'll do is show the cash of 80,000. We'll show the accounts receivable of 104, because basically what we're doing here, guys, is we're just totaling the um, figures. Um, the 80, uh, excuse me, this is for Hannah. The 104, we're going to see the allowance for uncollectibles here of 8, the supplies of 2, the equipment of 40, the liability of 64. So as you can see here, the 80, the 104, the 2, and the 40, 104, 184, um, 224, this is 226. We've got to show this credit of 8, that's 118, or 218. We have to put in the liability that the um, partnership is assuming to then show what the capital balance for Hannah Hark is going to be. So we're basically taking their assets, subtracting out the allowance for doubtful because 
really the 104 minus the 8 is really the accounts receivable. Um, showing the liability, the difference is going to be Hannah's capital. We're going to do the same thing with Jamie. The cash, the accounts receivable minus her allowance. Really, here the 40 minus 6 is really 34. The supplies and the equipment. Plus, she has is bringing in debt of 18000 So Jamie's capital here you can see is 97000 So um, Hannah's capital is 154. Jamie's is 97,000. So that is showing the initial um, accounting transaction to record the capital into the business. Let's look at another one. Um, let's look at um, Let's look at P1. On January 2013, Edie Thomas and George Lopez agreed to produce and sell chocolate candies. Thomas contributed 480000 in cash to the business. Lopez contributed the building and equipment valued at 440000 and 280000 respectively. So we're going to prepare the journal entry to record the investment of both partners. So we see here Thomas showed cash of 480000 contributed. Lopez contributed a building valued at 440, equipment valued at 280. So what we're going to do here to show this transaction is We'll show the cash of 480, the building of 440, the equipment of 280, and Thomas's capital capital will be 480. Lopez's capital will be 720. Okay. Now let's just take it a little step further, and we're going to allocate their income under various types of methods. It says here the partnership had income of 168000 during 2013, but was less successful during 2014 with income of only 80000 So we are going to distribute this income based on the first example, the partners share the income equally. Then the next example, will be the partners failed to agree on an income sharing agreement. We know if they agreed to, um, if they failed to agree on one, then it goes 50-50. And then C is going to be the partners agreed to share income according to the ratio of their original investment. So let's look at those three first to see how we will take this 168,000 and also the 80,000 and allocate it among the two partners. So the first one is equally. The partners failed to agree on one. So as you see here, if we do it equally, we take the 168,000 at 50%. In 2013, Thomas allocates 84 to him. Lopez will allocate 84 um, to her also. And in 2014, the income was at 80. They each are getting 40,000. So it's done equally. With B, if the partners fail to agree on it, then it has to be identical to the first one. It has to be shared equally. Now, Part C at tells us that we're going to allocate it based on their um, original investments. So their original investment, if we go back up here, one invested, contributed 480,000, one contributed 720,000. So if we take um, the 480, 480 plus 720 gives us 1.2 million. 
So basically what we're doing is we're figuring out the percent that 480,000 is to 1.2 million and allocating the income of 168 for 2013 based on this ratio. So basically we will come up with a ratio 168,000 times the 48 divided by 1.2 million to come up with the allocation for Thomas is 67,200. In 2014, the allocation is 32,000. And Lopez, we're doing the same thing, allocating her capital contribution to the total, the 480 plus the 720 equals 1.2 million. So we're taking her allocation and she will be allocated 100,800. And in 2014, um, the allocation will be 48,000. Okay, so that's basically taking it based on their capital contributions. Now we're going to get a little bit more complicated. With D, it tells us the partners agree to share income by allowing interest of 10% of their original investments. So basically, the partners agree to share income accord, excuse me, partners agree to share income by allowing interest of 10% on their original investments and dividing the remainder equally. So we're going to handle this similarly to what we did on the PowerPoint. Since we can distribute 168,000, the first piece is taking their initial investment times 10%. So 48,000 will be allocated to Thomas. 72,000, 10% of each, is allocated to Lopez. The 48 plus the 72 is 120,000. So that origi uh, originally is how we're allocating it. We're going to take the 168 minus this 120,000 that we've already distributed, and our balance left to distribute is 48,000. This 48,000 is going to be distributed 50-50, or 24,000 is going to go to each individual partner. So you can see here, in this fashion, Thomas receives 72,000 of the income, Lopez receives 96,000 of the income. Um, if we take it another step here, let's see what the next one says. The partners agree to share income by allowing salaries of 80,000 for Thomas and 56,000 for Lopez and dividing the remainder equally. So basically, what we're doing here, I'm trying to see what happened here. Income of partner. Oh, this is in the second year of 80,000 taking the, um, this is important. So if in the second year, they only brought in 80,000, and we have to take 10% for each person, Thomas gets 48, Lopez gets 72, but look at this, that's 120,000. And so that means we're in the whole 40,000. So we allocate based on their initial capital contribution. We give that to them, then this remaining $40,000 loss is going to be allocated equally. So technically speaking, Thomas is going to end up with 28. Lopez is going to end up with 52 for the 80,000 allocation. And basically, this really is an equitable way of doing it. Since Lopez didn't initially contribute as much as, um, Thomas didn't contribute as much as Lopez, they're allowing each of the partners to receive interest on their initial capital contribution. Sorry about that. Let's move on to the salaries. So again, if we see 168,000 is going to be allocated the first year, 
the salaries of 80 and 56 show a remaining balance to be allocated equally of 32,000. So we would then allocate 16 to each person. So Thomas in this case gets the 80 in salary plus, plus the 16 allocation or 96,000. Lopez gets the 56,000 in salary and 16,000 divided equally remaining for 72,000. In the next year, we're going to do it the same way. We allocate the salaries, but look here. That totals 136. The income was only at 80. So then this $56,000 negative balance needs to be allocated equally, which ultimately the 80 minus this 28, 52,000 is going to go to Thomas. Lopez is going to end up with the 56 minus the 28, or 28,000 being allocated to Lopez. So now we've got um, in F, the partners agree to share income by paying salaries of 80 and 56, allowing interest of 9% on their original investment, and then dividing the remainder equally. So three pieces here, and again, you'll see in this example, after allocating the salaries, there's 32000 left. Then we have to take their 9% um, on their initial balances, which means 43 will go to Thomas, 64 goes to Lopez. Well, that 43.2 and 64.8 is 108000 So our 32000 remaining income minus this um, 108 gives us a negative balance here of 76,000. This then needs to be allocated equally of a minus 38,000 each, which means basically that Thomas is going to get um, the income distributed of the 80 plus the 43,2 minus this 38,000 or 852. Lopez will get the 56 plus the 64.8 minus the 38,000 or 82,800 here. In the next year, we're going to do it the same way. The difference being that we only have 80,000 initially to distribute. So after allocating salaries, we're at a negative 56,000. Then, after allocating the interest of 43.2 and of 64.8, someone's on, here, let me, Tyler, I think, here, I'm going to mute your system so I don't hear you there. So, um, after the um, allocation of their initial contribution at, 10, at 9%, the 43.2 and the 64.8, to the negative $56,000 balance, we now need to add a negative 108,000 to have a total negative balance of 164,000. We divide that equally. So we can see here Thomas is going to get share of the income of 41.2. Lopez will receive share of the income of 38,800. So as you can see here, there's all kinds of way of allocating the income. And oftentimes it's just based on a ratio. And then there are other times where it can become a little more complicated. Now as we continue on, let's look at how the partnership dissolves itself. Dissolution occurs when there's a change in how it was originally set up. When partnerships dissolve, the partner loses their authority to continue business as that partnership. Now, it doesn't always mean it's um, ended. Uh, this does not mean that the business operation necessarily is ended or interrupted, but from a legal standpoint, this entity 
ceases to exist. So sometimes this happens because there's a new partner getting added or a partner is withdrawing from the business. If we have the admission of a new partner, the reason the old partnerships dissolve because now there's a new formation. We've added a third person and it is no longer the old partnership based on just two partners. So we're going to need to reallocate all of the capital balances. Make sure there's a new partnership agreement in place that takes into account this change. Individuals can be added or admitted to a partnership by either purchasing an interest in the partnership or investing assets in the partnership. So when they purchase an interest in the partnership, then if it's between just a partner, then that transaction basically is going to happen amongst just that one partner. But that interest purchase needs to be shown on the books because now instead of that one partner having a percent of the partnership, that ratio is going, that percent is going to be allocated now among the old partner and that new partner. So as an example here, Lori Mine decides to sell her interest of 70000 in Mine and Padilla to Adam Novak for 100000 Padilla agrees to the sale. So basically, we need to show that um, how this uh, transaction happens. So Lori Mines Capital is a debit of seventy thousand because we are removing her capital from the business. Adam now has seventy thousand in capital added to the business. Now, it, we talked about um, she was doing it for 100000 but we have to show the initial equity of 70000 The amount Novak pays Lori Mine is a personal matter between them. But what we need to do is the, take the book entry of Lori Mine's 70000 get that off the books, and um, add Adams for 70000 Adam purchases half of Lori's 70000 interest in the partnership and half of Rose Padilla's 80000 interest by paying a total of 100000 to the two partners. So what we'll do here is she's, he's purchasing half of Lori's 70 or 35, half of Rose's 80 or 40. So we've got 75,000 he's um, purchasing into the business, but he's purchasing it for 100,000. So as you see here, we will show a decrease in Lori Mines' capital of 35, a decrease in Rose's capital of 40, and an increase in Adam Novak's capital of 75000 If the asset accounts didn't reflect the current values, then the asset accounts need to be adjusted before admitting that new partner. When a new partner gets admitted through investing in the partnership, then the assets and the partner's equity in the firm increases. So as you see here, Adam wants to invest 75000 for a one-third interest in the partnership of Mind and Padilla. The capital accounts of Lori and Rose are 70000 and 80000 respectively. The assets of the firm are valued correctly, and they're going to admit Novak. So as you see here, Lori's capital balance is 70, Rose's is 80, Novak's is now going to be 75000 So we now have capital of 225, and Rose is now investing a one third interest in the partnership. So, one third interest, 33.33%, is going to be Novak's share of the partnership. You see, cash gets increased 75, 
and Adam's capital account will also then get increased 75000 A new partnership entity separate from its partners has been formed. The cash from the new partner, Adam Novak, goes to the partnership and not to the partners. The partnership assets and partnership equity have now grown by 75000 So depending how a new partner is added is um, indicative of how we are going to record that into um, the books. Sometimes new investors are willing to pay more than the actual dollar interest they receive in the partnership. And so that excess payment is a bonus to those original partners. So here, assume Mind and Padelia's firm has operated for a couple years and the partner's balances and ratios are um, capital balances, MIND 160, Padelia 140 for total balances of 30, and the ratios are 55 and 45. Now Adam wants to join, and he offers to invest 100000 for one-fifth interest in the business and income. So he's going to invest $100,000 to have a 20% um, uh, ratio in the business. So as you see here, the 30 plus the 100 of his investment is 400,000. Now, partner's equity assigned to Novak is 80,000. 20% of 400,000 would be 80. So the investment by Adam He's investing 100, but he's only going to have equity of 80. So that extra amount he's paying in, or that 20,000, is going to be allocated 55% to Lori and 45% to Padelia. So that extra bonus he's paying in, 11 of it is going straight to Lori, 9 of it is going to Padelia. So the journal entry to record the bonus, the cash gets increased 100, Lori Mine Capital is increased 11, Rose Padilla Capital is increased 9, and Adam Novak has a capital account of 80 because he's investing, or he wants a 20% um, balance, uh, capital uh, percent in the partnership. Now a new partnership has been formed. Um, Lori, Mind, and Padilla receive an increase in their capital accounts for part of Adam's contribution to the partnership. Because Novak wants to join, um, he's willing to pay a bonus for the business as it stands as what he's buying into it. Why would a business partnership want to have a new partner? Well, it brings in more cash to the partnership, and they might want to expand markets. They might need the capital, or that partner is going to bring business that they may not have had previously without having that partner. Um, let's look at the bonus to the new partner. Let's say that Lori and Rose need Adam to enter into the partnership. They have a, um, an invested interest in having him in it. And so in this case, they're going to give him a bonus for joining. So they, Novak is going to invest 60000 for one-fourth interest in the company. The ratios initially were 55 and 45%, and then Novak's going to get a 25% interest into the firm. So you see here, Lori Mines account was at 160, Padilla was at 140, Novak's now investing 60. So the new partnership's capital accounts are at 360. If Novak's share is 25% or 90,000 of that 360, then what we need to do is that remaining 30,000 bonus needs to be allocated from Lori and Padilla and Rose's capital accounts. 
So they want him so bad, they're willing to give up uh, some of their own capital to have him in the business. So that remaining 30000 gets allocated, 55 to from Lori, 45 from Rose, or 165 from Lori, 135 from Rose. So 165 will be decrease Lori's capital, and Rose's capital will be decreased 135. So as you see here, cash of 16, Lori Mine Capital 165, Rose Padilla Capital 135, for Adam to have a 25% um, share in the company of 90,000. So now a new partnership has been formed, and Lori and Rose were willing to accept a decrease in their accounts to get him into the business. Now I'm going to take a five-minute break here, and I'm going to uh, be able to uh, get the um, this portion of the slide loaded onto YouTube. And 